Hello, and welcome to Marvel in a Minute, presented by Crushing Comics. I'm your host, Peter, and I am here to cover all of the Marvel comics that were out on Wednesday, September 12th. But there's a catch. I have to cover each one of the comics in just one minute. So that means it could wind up being a review or reaction, just me shouting incoherently. I don't know, because I don't script it ahead of time. I read the comic, I make my notes, and then I get on camera and I talk for a minute. So that's what we're going to do. It only includes the Marvel comics that are in continuity, so no Star Wars comics, no comics that are in side universes or all ages. This is the stuff that counts in the Marvel 616 reality. Are you ready? For each comic, I'll tell you the creative team, and then I'll dive right in. When the clock is done, I'm done saying my piece, although sometimes I find a way to go a little bit over. Here we go. Amazing Spider-Man issue number five was written by Nick Spencer with line art from Ryan Otley, inks from Otley and Cliff Rathburn, colors from Laura Martin, letters from Joe Caramanga, and a cover by Ryan Otley and Laura Martin. Ready? Go. I have not really loved this Amazing Spider-Man opening arc by Nick Spencer, and I think I can put my finger on it now that I've read this issue. It feels like he is going to a very kind of all ages Spider-Man, like it's much more readable for younger readers than Dan Slott's Spider-Man was, but it's just not quite um, as snappy as Dan Slott's was. And I know it's harder because when you're trying to write to a broader audience, it's harder to be as snappy. You can't be as cynical. You can't be as precise. But that's really what it feels like here. This arc ends this idea of there being two different Spider-Men at the same time, two different Peters split in half. And while it was a really good concept, I don't know that we got all all that we got out of it and the finale here really just doesn't even feel all that significant so it just feels like we kind of spent five issues i don't know doing what we didn't really learn a lot about peter parker we didn't really learn a lot about his current environment although we do know he's back with mj i think that there could be good things to come but i'm waiting for spencer to get ah, ah, ah. i'm waiting for spencer i ran out I'm waiting for spencer to get back into that mode he was in and superior foes of spider man and ant-man he's so funny there i don't know where he is but i'm hoping he's coming back Champions, issue number 24, was written by Jim Zub, with line art from Sean Isaacs, color art from Marcio Menez and Eric Artnega, letters from Clayton Cowles, and a cover from Sean Isaacs and Marcio Menez. Ready? Here we go. This is a very special Champions issue in the way that there were very special after-school specials uh, when we were kids on TV, and it has to do with the absolute plague of gun violence in American schools today. And the way that the issue handles it is that it has gun violence at Miles Morales' school. He's back after his brief hiatus after his series ended with issue 240, and he's not there to do anything about it, and by the time he gets there, it's too late. Um, I feel like this issue tried really hard to explore the trauma that kids, teens are experiencing right now because of this without getting political. It doesn't really have a lot to say about gun violence and guns and gun control other than um, Riri making a comment on it. She should. She has a history. But I feel like that takes away part of the impact. I'm happy we talked about the trauma for the characters. I think we got a great scene with Ms. Marvel that expressed that and maybe gets a little bit to what kids are feeling just trying to go to school and learn today. But I think that these characters are deadly weapons. And how do you not address the fact that... Ah, I have a lot to say about this one. Um... I'll just finish that thought. How do you express that fully without acknowledging that these kids, these champions, are deadly weapons? And even when they're there, if they were there, they might not have been able to do anything. I think that really is the second powerful step of this, other than the trauma. And I don't know that we got all the way there. I'm happy that Zub wrote it. I'm happy that Sean Isaacs drew it. I think it's a great issue. I just don't think it quite got all the way to the place that I was hoping it was going to get. And Daredevil issue 608 is written by Charles Soule with art from Phil Noto, letters from Clayton Cowles, and a cover also by Phil Noto. Ready? Here we go. So this has been a really fun arc, a nice uh, way to, to assuage our heavy feelings that we get from usually reading Deadpool because it tends to be a pretty heavy title. We have this Mike Murdoch who's been conjured out of thin air to seemingly been, be real, and we really have a chance to get rid of him in this issue, and we don't quite get rid of him the way you think we might get rid of him, and that is going to lead to some interesting things in the world of Daredevil. Look, this was not quite as slapstick funny as some of the initial issues that we got in this arc, but it's really satisfying. It reminds us that Daredevil can be lighthearted and fun in the way that he was in the Silver Age, in the way that he was when he was just written by Mark Wade, and it was a nice, 
fun arc. I don't know if I would tell you to start here. I'm really ish- interested to see what the next issue is, and I think some people should start there. But it was incredibly satisfying, and it really put a smile on my face at the end of the issue. Domino, issue number six, was written by Gail Simone with art from David Baldion and color art from Jesus Zabertov, letters from Clayton Cowles, and a cover by Greg Land and Frank Dramata. Here we go. Domino, I feel like this issue tried to stuff a lot of comics into just one issue, and because of that, it suffered a little bit. We have Domino's big climactic fight, which was fun, and which we wanted, and which resolves plot points from her childhood, but then we had a B-plot with Diamondback and Outlaw, and then we had another B-plot with the boat where Domino was living, and then we had, like, the inside of Domino's head plot about how she's been training with Shang-Chi, and we, it just felt like too much. It didn't feel like we got to spend quality time with any of the characters, and it felt a little bit overstuffed. That said, it is really fun to be reading a female-led solo comic that is violent, irreverent, silly, um, lusty, all of these things. I feel like there's not a lot of options for that in the comic buying public right now to give us that kind of Deadpool or Harley Quinn vibe. Harley Quinn is probably the only other one that feels like this, but Harley Quinn is way, way more absurd of a character than Domino, who can be a little bit grounded and a little bit believable. So I'm willing to give this a pass for being a little bit overstuffed because I'm excited to see what Simone can do with more issues. If you want to hear me go way more in depth in Domino and all of the X-Men comic books that are coming up on this episode, you need to tune into the next show on this channel, which will be my weekly This Week in X show, where I'll go way, way deeper into all the themes and characters of all the X-Men comic books out this week. We are skipping past Exiles, issue number eight. I'm sure it's very good. I've heard good things about it, but it is set in alternate timelines and there's only so much time in my day, so Crisis, don't play that, okay? Fantastic Four issue number two was written by Dan Slott with pencils from Sarah Pacelli, inks from Pacelli along with Elisabetta D'Amico, colors from Marta Gracia, letters from Joe Caramaga, and a cover by Isad Ribic. Here we go. I didn't enjoy this issue. I don't think Dan Slott has the right understanding of the Richard Storm family. We know he's written Thing and he's written Human Torch and people liked those, but I think there's a reason he wrote those two members of the Fantastic Four and not the rest of them. He ages up all of the kids in the Fantastic Four by about a decade, pretty much just to give us a moment of Valeria flirting and then later being too lovesick to do anything. It feels like he did it just to be able to um, punch down at that character. And I'm not saying that as somebody who's a fan of the character, although I am. I'm saying it as somebody who doesn't understand why you would do that to a character. I don't know what's going to come of it. Maybe he'll write something very, very interesting, but now it feels really hollow. I'd give him benefit of the doubt, but it feels the same way in terms of Franklin and his creating of universes. Sue Storm and her love for the team. Reed Richards and his love of wisdom and knowledge, it all feels just kind of misunderstood. Iceman issue number one was written by Cena Grace with art from Nathan Stockman, color art from Federico Blee, letters from Joe Sabino, and a cover by W. Scott Forbes. Ready? Here we go. This Iceman series, it's back from the dead. We had an 11-issue Iceman series with Cena Grace at the helm. It got canceled probably for low sales, but then the trade sales were strong, even though they canceled it before the trades came out, and now we're back. So you would think after all that drama, and after a chance to kind of take a breather and kind of choose your shot and aim carefully, that this would be a really great issue. Well, sorry, it's not. Uh, There's people who liked it. I understand that they liked it. I'm not saying that it can't be enjoyed, but it's that same kind of like, this is fine sort of comic books. Iceman isn't especially witty. The action isn't especially clear. Uh, I really continue to have some problems with Frederico Blee's colors across all books here. The colors feel way too pushed and ruddy and oversaturated for what this book is, um, which should probably have a little bit more of an indie feel. Maybe some of Cena's Grace's script would land more that way. Look, I am all for reading about gay Iceman. I'm into it. I always thought he was gay even before he was gay because of all the hints that many writers dropped over the years, but I just wish we could get a more interesting series. Last time it took a while for Cena Grace to get into the rhythm. This time we only have five issues. Get with it, Cena. Infinity Wars number three was written by Jerry Dugan with art from Mike Diodato Jr., color art from Frank Martin, letters from Corey Petit, and a cover from Mike Diodato Jr. and Rain Barreto. Ready? Go. I was reminded of an interesting word this week. The word is toyetic, and it means that something has a quality that would lend it to like a cartoon or being merchandised as toys. That's what this issue is. Dugan has written one of Marvel's best all-time epics, starting with his all-new Guardians of the Galaxy in 2017, continuing through Marvel Legacy into Infinity Countdown and into Infinity Wars. It's amazing. I just reread the whole thing this past week. I'm probably going to read it again in a couple more weeks. It's amazing comics. So I have way, way big 
benefit of the doubt for this issue, which is still fine, but it's kind of the issue that lets us like take a step back, take a breath, and introduce all the various possible spin-offs and interesting things that could happen while the series resolves itself as its main thread. So we're going to see some infinity warps in the coming months. That's okay, because the questions that get asked here about what it means to have that infinite power, um, if Thanos has in a way tainted not only Gamora, but also the Infinity Stones for all possible future people, uh, people and also what's going on in the God Quarry, these are great interesting questions and I want to know more. Journey into Mystery, The Birth of Krakoa, issue number one, it's a one-shot, was written by Dennis Hopeless, with art from Jabril Morissette Fan, color art from Raquel Rosenberg, letters from Travis Lanham, and a cover from Greg Smallwood. Here we go. This has a very confusing title, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It makes it out like it might be sort of an x men comic book, because it talks about Krakoa, and we all know that's from Giant Size X-Men. It turns out to be way more of a Nick Fury and the Howling Commandos comic. Marvel's doing some kind of backdoor Nick Fury revival. I don't know if it's because we have the black Nick Fury that's going to be in Captain Marvel in uh, early next year, the movie, or what, but I'm kind of here for it. This Dennis Hopeless really hits that vibe of, you know, Journey in the Mystery, Tales to Astonish, all those great Marvel anthologies series that gave way to superheroes, but like right before they did, we'd get these one-off issues about the dangers of nuclear weapons or, you know, how one thing ev evolving faster in its environment could change the environment for everything else. It feels like that, and I'm fine with it kind of not going anywhere or not starting from anything else or not even really connecting to Giant Size X-Men. We really already knew all of these things about Krakoa. None of it is brand new to us here, but I liked it. If you like those kind of pulpy 50s and 60s styles anthology comics, you will enjoy this. It's a fun read. This Marvel issue number 34 was written by G. Willow Wilson with art from Nico Leon, color art from Ian Herring, letters from Joe Caramanga, and a cover from Valerio Shiti and Raquel Rosenberg. Ready? go. Ms. Marvel has never been a high concept comic book. It's actually low concept, right? Like this girl's got powers, but it's really about her, her friends, her family, and her culture, both in terms of her Pakistani family and her culture within living in New Jersey, just a regular kid. Well, this takes low concept to high concept. We get a little bit more information about how Ms. Marvel's powers have been working all this time. How does she get bigger and shrink? You know, at the very beginning of her series, she paid for using her powers a lot more. She was always like way more wiped out. She like felt like she couldn't recover and that went away. And I've been wondering where it happened. Well, now we understand a little bit more of that. It's a little bit shocking. It's a little bit big. It might not work for you if you've only been here for the low concept part, but I think this really lifts what was a very kind of generic story of her fighting against Shocker of all people out of the kind of average villain story territory and into something much bigger and more interesting. Does it mean we're coming up to a climax where G. Willow Wilson might finally step away from this title? Or is this just a hint of longer term things to come? I don't know, but this is why, one of the many reasons why I'm out of time and why I read Miss Marvel. Old Man Logan issue number 47 was written by Ed Brazan with art from Damian Cochero, color art from Carlos Lopez, letters from Corey Petit, and a cover from Andrea Sorrentino. Ready? go. This is the second of a two-part story, and your love for this hinges a lot on whether you have some affinity for vintage Alpha Flight. In terms of the villain that they're fighting or this monster, it doesn't really matter. It's all kind of just blah, whatever. Uh, not bad, but not really memorable either. In terms of Old Man Logan's arc on the series, it actually feels like we've reversed a little bit. He gets way more hurt here, and he seems way more blasé about it than he was previously. Um, so it doesn't even really fulfill that ongoing arc. It's really just down to do you want to see some snowbird, shaman, guardian, and puck on panel doing some stuff? Can you imply a lot of things based on the relationship you already know they have with Wolverine and what their powers do and how they function? If so, you're going to really enjoy this comic. It's a lot of fun. I think Alpha Flight actually works better in these small doses in other people's titles than they work all together by themselves. So I've enjoyed them in Captain Marvel as kind of the Alpha Flight space defense force, and I've enjoyed them while they've ship been shipped back planet side here, and I hope we continue to see them pop up around the Marvel Universe. Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man, issue 309, was written by Chip Zdarsky with pencils and colors from Chris Bocklow, inks from Livesay, Al Vey, Tim Townsend, Victor Olabaza, and Wayne Fosher, letters from Travis Lanham, and a cover by Chris Bocklow. Ready? Here we go. 
I think that uh, Zdarsky is one of the best superhero writers at Marvel right now, which is funny to say because we think of him as this humor writer and of an artist of sex criminals. And he just spent a little bit too long on the first arc of this title. And I love long arcs that develop over time, but it kind of didn't have any branches. It was just plugging away at one thing. And it's a relief that it's over. The last issue in this issue were a two-part Sandman story. The last issue is actually almost a bit avant-garde and strange, and I loved it. Chris Bocklow's art for it was perfect. This issue gets a little bit more normal. It's a big fight, but it's a big, different kind of fun fight between Peter Parker and not Sandman as you think he'd be fighting Sandman. I think if you're looking for like a really fun Spider-Man title that's also going to make you think and that amazing Spider-Man title hasn't been doing it for you, pick up this issue and the prior issue, so 308 and 309. I think you might be really satisfied. I think I've heard that Chip Zdarsky is going to be off this title, and it's a pity. Much like his writing Marvel 2-in-1 in, in place of Fantastic Four, I think he's got a better feel for this character than the title author that's on the ongoing right now. Runaways issue number 13 was written by Rainbow Rowell with art from David La Fuente, color art from Jim Campbell, letters from Joe Caramanga, and a cover from Chris Anka. Ready? Let's go. Runaways number 13 uh, is a great example of how much control the art team has over the tone of a title. Not just the penciler, but the color artist. Jim Campbell does fine color work here. It's great, it's strong, but it's much shinier, glossier than the way that Matt Wilson had been coloring Chris Anka's pencils. And since we also changed to a new pencil, Laura, David LaFuente, this has a completely different feel. It feels like we've just started a whole new comic book. You know what? Maybe that's fine. This is, it feels like we wrapped up what's going on in year one of Runaways with issue 12 and we're on to something new so if the feel's going to change the feel's going to change but it also added to like the briskness of the story it's a very like punch first ask questions later kind of story that throws in an iconic uh old character we know from runaways past back in with these new runaways that have, although the new old same legacy whatever runaways um and it's fun, but it's going to feel a little bit slight, I think, because the art just doesn't have that same textured feel that it did before, and it just goes by really quickly. So I think good things will continue to happen, but this issue, not my fave. The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, issue number 36, was written by Ryan North with art from Derek Charm and art in a mini-comic inside the comic from Madeline McGrain, color art from Rico Renzi, and letters from Travis Lanham with a cover by Erica Henderson. Here we go. Uh, I have so much to say about Squirrel Girl, I've never gotten to talk about it before. Uh, the thing that you need to know is Squirrel Girl reads really slowly. Like, I've been reading some to catch up, and each issue of Squirrel Girl usually takes me 15 to 20 minutes to read, which is an eternity compared to most Marvel comics that take me 5 to 8 minutes, so like 2 to 3 times as much. I say that because this is a silent issue, there is no speech in this issue, and even without any letters, uh, or at least word balloons, it still took me almost 10 minutes to read this carefully because there's so many visual gags. There's so much happening. I love the new penciler, Derek Charm, on this. I think that this is an example where you keep the same colorist at Rico Renzi, and the colorist maintains the feel, even though the look of the book has actually changed a lot in terms of the line art. It's a very clever one-off story. It's it's fun. It's Squirrel Girl. It has the Avengers in it. It just feels super authentic and super on voice for this title, even though there's no voice in the issue. But the greatest thing about Squirrel Girl, never a waste of your time or money, because it's something really meaty to read every time. Venom First Host issue number three is written by Mike Costa with pencils from Mark Bagley and Ron Lim, inks from Andrew Hennessy and Scott Hanna, colors from Dono Sanchez Almada, letters from Clayton Cowles, and a cover from Mark Bagley and Richard Eisenhoff. Go! here's what I've decided now that we're halfway into the series. It's a very 90s comic book. Venom famously had a string of never-ending limited series in the 1990s, which added up to what would have been over a 60-issue uh, ongoing series, had it been ongoing. And this feels very much like those. We have big twists, which are twisted again. We have huge info dumps. We have hairpin turns of the plot. And that has a very 90s nostalgic feeling for me. So I think if you're only a modern comic reader and you're looking at this series, you're kind of going to be like, oh, what is this? It's lumpy. It's slow. It doesn't make sense. You're going to wing all of these modern criticisms out of that. And you know what? That's fine. But I read it in terms of the legacy of Venom, and in that way it feels very classic to me, even though it's doing some very unexpected things with the character. I keep saying this because it's a weekly series, so it's the third week in a row I've marveled in a minute about it, but um, this is, if you're not okay with the idea that Venom is part of the greater galaxy of the Marvel Universe, and you don't want to know more about the symbiote being from space and another planet, then this is going to disappoint you. Weapon H, issue number 8, was written by Greg Pak, with art from Ario Anandito, color art from Maury Hollowell, letters from Joe Caramanga, and a cover from Philip Tan and Romulo Florgiardo Jr. 
Ready? Go. This is another one I haven't had a chance to marvel in a minute about yet. You would think that this series is such like a, right? It's like a combination of Wolverine and Hulk, who's a soldier and beats things up and adventures across the countryside. No, just no. Except for just yes. It's been so fun. It has so much spirit. It's got so much punch. Greg Pak makes sure it's really light, fun, easy to read with a couple of heavy moments. Um, again, this is something that to me reads very 90s, but not in as much of a throwback way as that Venom issue. This issue, we get a little bit of a team up with Weapon H and Captain America, and there's this great thing happening where Weapon H is kind of speechless. He doesn't quite know what to say to Captain America, who's like several generations of hero preceding him and who's somebody who inspired him. And without doing a big monologue, about it. It's really effective. I don't know what to tell you, but this title, it's fun to read. I like it. I think I like it better than the current Hulk title from Al Ewing, which is crazy. So if you want to read a Hulk who's kind of got like a military bent and a title that's quick moving, full of adventure and punching stuff, this is the title for you. X-23 issue number four was written by Mariko Tamaki with art from Juan Cabal, color art from Nolan Woodard, letters from Corey Petit, and cover from Mike Choi and Jesus Abertov. Ready? Let's go. This issue is decompressed. If that's the thing that bugs you, I don't think you're going to like it. And it's certainly not the issue to jump in, but let me tell you, I am totally sold on this clone versus clone plot that we're getting with X-23 versus the Stepford Cuckoos. Last issue was the chase issue. It was fast. It was kinetic. There was lots of action. This issue is much slower. The chase is still happening, but it's closer up, and it feels like the closer we get these characters together, the more that time dilates and things get slower for both of them. We have to spend more time with them, and I think that's really good pacing. It's a time that I want something to be decompressed because I want to just watch somebody take a few steps slowly. I want to watch two people stalk each other. And for me, that's why this felt more like an X-23 comic than some of the past issues. Plus, the art is just beyond. I don't know if anybody at Marvel is doing what Juan Cabal and Nolan Woodard are doing on this title. They give hints of Frank Quietly from Morrison's new X-Men. They give hints of John Cassidy and Laura Martin from Whedon's X-Men. It is incredible artwork. Incredible. If you want to hear me go on more at length about the artwork and about the series, again, all of the X-Men comic books, including the next comic I'll be covering, are all in my This Week in X, which will be the next show to be uploaded on this channel, so please keep your eyes out. X-Men Blue, issue number 35, was written by Colin Bunn, with art from Marcus Toe, color art from Matt Miller, letters from Joe Caramanga, and a cover from R.B. Silva and Matt Miller. Ready? X-Men Blue follows the time-displaced teen X-Men, and love them or hate them, it seems like their time in the present might be coming to a close based on what we're seeing in Extermination. Now, this happens before Extermination. It says that explicitly on the credits page, and it's an issue that I've been waiting for a long time because it's each of these characters coming to terms with the idea of what is worse, staying in the present or going back to the past. Now, for most of them, it seems like it would be better to stay in the present, but not all of them, and for some of them, going back in the, to the past will erase major changes that have happened in their life since they have been here. And we explore this in five vignettes, one for each of the characters, as they interact with their older selves in the present, which of course is possible now for Jean, now that we have old Jean Grey back. Still not possible for Cyclops, though, because he'll be talking to a tombstone. I think Bun writes the ever-living daylights out of this issue, and whether you haven't read all new X-Men since the first arc from Brian Bendis and Stuart Immonen back at the end of 2012, or whether you've been keeping up all along, this is the one that you could read to get ready for extermination and probably like it. Now it is time for me to give you my pick of the week and the series I think you should catch up on this week. I have one minute to make my selection for each of those things. Here we go with pick of the week, single issue pick of the week. What was the best single issue? Well, Champions, you know, was meant to be a very good single issue, but I had some problems with it. Daredevil is really enjoyable, but it was the end of an arc. Uh, I think I might have two. So one of them is X-Men Blue. Look, I'm an X-Men fan through and through. I think it was incredibly well done, as I said in its minute. And I think if you have any awareness of these time-displaced characters, it's very satisfying, and it's going to help you get into what's happening with X-Men next. And it looks very good as well. Marcus Toe uh, does a tremendous job. So I think uh, for any anybody who has any awareness of those characters, that's my pick. But I have to also pick Squirrel Girl. The Squirrel Girl silent issue, I think a lot of people know Ryan North because he did Dinosaur Comics and all these other 
quippy things. And they think Squirrel Girl is great because it's quippy. But really what makes it great is he can get so much done in a single issue. And he does that here with no dialogue whatsoever, working with a relatively new artist. And it still lands just as much as every Squirrel Girl issue usually lands. And I think that's a really impressive feat. So that was my one minute of pick of the week. Now I'm going to tell you what series I think you should catch up on because it's really worth catching up on. So let's let's see what we've got here. I mean, again, that Daredevil arc was really good, but to me, it's just the whole all of Daredevil, and that's a lot to endorse to catch up on. Um, uh, well, first of all, I really loved that uh, Peter Parker Spectacular Spider-Man story, and that's only a two-issue arc, so that's really easy to catch up on. Uh, Weapon H I, has been really surprising me, and I think that um, if you are into that kind of thing that I described in the minute, that it would be worth reading. But I have to highlight Jerry Dugan's Infinity Wars. I sat down this week, I read it all from the start, and it starts with his pickup of All New Guardians of the Galaxy in 2017. It totally holds together. For some of the material, it was the second time I've reread it, and honestly, I just want to read it again. And luckily, because he's been on this run since May of 2017, a ton of it is on Marvel Unlimited already. So even if you can't get all the way up to present, you can see how he started all these little threads at the beginning of the run and they're like still paying off now in this issue so super high endorsement of jerry dugan and infinity wars which began as infinity countdown which began as guardians of the galaxy which began as all new guardians of the galaxy that is it for this week's Marvel in a Minute. Thank you so much for watching. I've loved the feedback that you're giving me in the comments. It's let me tweak this and make it better every week. Comments for feedback are great. Liking and subscribing are great. It not only tells me that you're paying attention, that you enjoy this content, but it tells YouTube, which makes it easier for other people to find this content too. If you know somebody who's been trying to keep up with the Marvel Universe in your life, give them this episode and let them catch up too. I would love for this to be the hub of all sorts of people who are trying to read all sorts of Marvel and trying to decide what else to read, or at least how they can keep up with it. So that has been this week's Marvel in a Minute. Tune in for the next show, which will be This Week in X, for the deep dive on X-Men comic books. And until then, make mine Marvel. 